Okay, students, welcome to the second uh, video of topic D.1. It's going to be a little more technical um, and analytical than the first, which was largely descriptive. And I want to talk first about energy sources of stars. Uh, we've talked a little bit about this before, but remember the difference between nuclear fusion and fission? And I think at the time that we studied nuclear physics, I told you guys that um, fusion occurs inside of, of stars. And this involves lighter nuclei going to heavy, heavier nuclei, okay? And a typical reaction inside of a star might be something like this. Hydrogen into helium, uh, which, which creates a neutrino and a photon and an alpha particle here, okay? Um, and remember that each reaction in a nuclear fusion reaction releases an incredible, actually, amount of energy considering how many reactions there are, okay? It's about 26.7 mega electron volts, okay? Now, very, very quickly, I'm going to get more into what happens uh, inside stars later, but here's what happens. So you have material inside of a star at very, very, very high temperatures, and I'll talk about how that even begins to happen inside of a star later on. Turns out that the temperatures are so high that the nuclei have enough kinetic energy to approach each other, overcoming, um, overcoming electrostatic repulsion. And the nuclei of the helium of the hydrogen fuse to produce helium, and in the process, they produce energy through fusion. Now, the kinetic energy of the nuclei, which is referred to radiation pressure, ends up being great enough, or pushing outwards, ends up being great enough to balance the gravitational force of the star's own weight once it starts to really, really start building. And this fusion keeps the star hot and radiates, uh, radiates all this energy um, into space. So I'm just looking at the, at, the, uh, at the IB guide here. They want you to qualitatively describe the equilibrium between pressure and gravitation in stars. And there you go, I've done it for you, okay? Okay, so remember that stars are nuclear fusion reactors and of course, as we've talked about in class, all stars, all atoms in the universe were made inside stars. Okay, so let's talk about stellar parallax. Okay, and this is one method to determine the approximate distances to stars. Now, parallax refers to, um, depending on your viewpoint, you might see different things. So for example, if you're at A and you're looking at this object and there's red, white, and blue background behind, you're going to see you're going to see the object in front of a blue background. If you move down to point B and look up at the object, you're going to see the object in front of a red background. So we deal with this in science all the time. You know, I say that you know, when you're reading, reading the height of a liquid in a graduated cylinder, for example, you don't want to be at a big angle. You want to be right, even, have your eyes eyeball even with the level of the water, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's because of this concept called parallax, okay? And simply put, it's when an object viewed from two different positions appears displaced relative to a fixed background. Now, this is actually important when we look at stars because even though the, even though the radius of the Earth's orbit around the sun is very small, it's big enough to actually affect how stars may appear towards one another if we have a sensitive enough telescope. And that's exactly what happens. We can actually detect difference and the differences in the relative positions of stars uh, throughout the course of the year. And of course, in six months, we are as far apart as we are at any other time in our orbit, right? Okay. Now, in this case, uh, in this diagram, which is greatly exaggerated, you see January and July. There's a distance between them, which is equal to the diameter of the Earth's uh, orbit. Okay. In this case, we have this angle P. It turns out that the tangent of P is equal to R over d, of course, okay? So d is r over tangent p, but we're going to use the small angle approximation and say that the tangent of p is approximately equal to p, okay? And in this case, d would then equal r over p, where p is called the parallax angle, and it's going to be in radians, and r, of course, is one astronomical unit because that's the radius of the Earth's orbit around the sun. Pretty cool, huh? Now, there are 360 degrees in a circle, there are 60 what we call arc minutes in a degree, and there are 60 what we call arc seconds in a minute, okay? If this is the case, then, uh, then one second would be <clears throat> 4.8 times 10 to the minus 6 radians, okay? Now, this whole idea of degrees, minutes, and seconds, okay? Uh, if you've ever studied geography, this is the way that the Earth, uh, the latitude and longitude are all set out about on the Earth in terms of dictating where a particular location is. So, for example, 
San Francisco in the United States is located at 37 degrees north, 37 minutes, which is a 60th of a degree, 11 seconds, which is 1 60th of a minute, okay? That's north, and then 122 degrees, 22 minutes, 47 seconds west, okay? So every particular location on the Earth has a very unique set of latitude and longitude coordinates, okay? Now, it turns, turns out that parallaxes down to one second are actually quite easy to measure with modern telescopes. Obviously, the farther away the star, the smaller the parallax angle. So there's a limitation in terms of how far away we can tell a star is uh, using the parallax method, okay? If it's too far away, it's not even possible. So from the Earth, we can actually use the parallax method to determine the distances of stars up to about 300 light years away, so not very far away, okay? From orbiting satellites, we can actually figure, use parallax to detect stars that are 500 light years away uh, because there are no atmospheric effects, okay? Now, again, just to remind you, a parsec is the distance at which um, well, this is a different, actually, this is a different definition, okay? I said it was the average distance between galaxies, but now it turns out that a parsec is a distance at which one astronomical unit subtends an angle of one second, okay? Um, and and that, that happens to be the case. Then, since d is r over p as before, we have that d in parsecs is equal to 1 over p in arc seconds, and that's given to you in your data booklet. Okay, so try this example first. Very simple stuff. First thing we have to do is we have to, because our equation gives us parsecs, we have to work with parsecs, we have to convert 10.8 light years into parsecs. I get that that's 3.31 parsecs, and then I get that it is, the parallax angle is 0.3 seconds, okay? All right, how about this one? The smallest angle that can be measured between light rays that arrive at the surface of the Earth is, okay? What's the distance to a star that subtends this angle? Again, using the equation, it might actually help to draw a diagram, which I should have done. Sorry about that. It's 326 light years. Okay, now I want to talk about um, luminosity and brightness of stars. And this is going to lead into a much more technical discussion later when we talk about Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams in topic D2, which is pretty cool, but you're going to have to just wait for that, okay? Okay, anyway, luminosity, uh, as you probably have surmised, is how bright a light is, okay? So it's obviously related to, the ener to energy and photons. And in astronomy, luminosity has the variable capital L, and it's simply the amount of energy per second radiated by a star. So because it's energy per second, it has units of watts, okay? Now, this does not change with respect to distance from the star or any other factor. It doesn't matter how far away you are from a star, it's still putting out the same amount of energy per second, okay? Now, if you consider uh, a sphere, oh, this is a picture of Sirius, by the way, a sphere of radius D centered on a, on a star, like a hollow sphere. The star radiates in all directions. In one small area on the sphere, this, a very small fraction of energy is received, and we've talked about this before when we talked about topic 8 and the energy received by, uh, by the disk of the Earth and space from the Sun. Okay? Anyway, in a small area on the sphere, this, a, very small energy, a very small fraction of energy is received, and that would be A divided by the total surface area of the sphere. So the energy received per second would be A times L over 4 pi d squared, because 4 pi d squared is the, is the area of the inner part of that sphere, okay? So um, that's important because it helps us to define what's called apparent brightness, and that's uh, lowercase b is the variable in astrophysics. And that's the received energy per second per unit area from a star, and it's in watts per square meter, and it's given by L over 4 pi d squared, so um, obviously it's the same as this equation divided by the area, right? Now this changes with respect to distance from the star because L is your main variable here, right? So as L goes, uh, uh, sorry, D is your main variable here. So as D goes up, the apparent brightness goes way down, which is very simple. That's very common sense, right? The farther away a star is, the less bright it will appear to be. Well, it's also an inverse squared law, which is pretty cool that that's another example of an inverse square law, okay? So again, brightness is proportional to 1 over the area, which is 1 over the distance squared. And this is easy to see when you think about, again, how light spreads out. You should study this diagram a little bit. It's a very, very interesting sort of mathematical um, sequence in a way, right? 
And remember, we can measure apparent brightness with a, with a CCD camera, with a charge coupled device, which we haven't talked much about, uh, which I can definitely talk about in class if you guys uh, want to. And that's how we get astronomical imaging. And I'll show you guys some, some examples of astronomical images in class. Okay? All right, if you remember the Stefan Boltzmann equation, okay, then uh, what we can do is, <coughs> sorry, L is equal to, um, to the Stefan Boltzmann constant times A times the temperature uh, in Kelvin to the fourth power. So therefore, we can combine our new uh, expression for, bright, uh, for apparent brightness with luminosity here. Okay, and luminosity is is power. By the way, it's the same thing uh, essentially. Um, and then we have that B is sigma a t to the fourth over four pi d squared. Okay, and this is given to you in the data booklet. This equation right here is given to you in the data booklet. Okay, so let's do an example. So pause the video, read this one, and try it on your own. Okay. So I get, uh, let's see, asking for both star luminosity, the sun, and Sirius. Interesting. Um, so for Sirius, I get that the luminosity is 1.2 times 10 to the minus 7 watts per square meter. For the sun, it's much, obviously, the sun is much closer. So you would expect it to be much brighter than Sirius, although Sirius is a pretty bright star in the sky. Okay. Now, if you were to place each star, our sun and Sirius, at a distance of 10 parsecs away and then look at them, this is very, very interesting. They would be approximately the same brightness when placed side by side at that distance. Very interesting, right? Okay, example seven. Try this one. A star has half the sun's surface temperature and 400 times its luminosity. How many times bigger is it than the sun? Okay, so the first thing you want to do is find the ratio of the star's um, radii. Okay, star being the star in question and our sun. By the way, this circle with a dot in it is the sort of universal symbol for sun, for our sun. Okay, um, I end up that I end up getting, uh, and you can follow the math here. But the star has a radius that's 80 times that of the sun. Okay, 80 times that of the sun. Okay, remember the black body radiation diagram? You were you thought you were done with this, right? Well, you're not. Okay, remember that bodies at different temperatures. Um, emit electromagnetic radiation in waves at different peak intensities or power per unit area. So as the temperature increases, the amount of available available energy increases, right? That's why this that's why this this peaks so dramatically. Okay. Since E equals H F, these photons have higher frequencies, of course, and thus shorter wavelengths. So the total intensity of radiation at a certain temperature is the area under the curve. Very cool. So if this were a calculus-based class, we could do some calculus here, but we're not going to do that. Um, but anyway, really cool. So again, Stefan Boltzmann, it's so a power per unit area is equal to, to um, sigma times t to the fourth, and L is equal to sigma time a times t to, t to the fourth. Okay, And this is given to you in your data booklet. Okay. And given Wien's law, which we studied before, uh, we come up with that relationship between the peak wavelength and the temperature, and that's where that comes from. Okay. Okay. A couple other things about this diagram I should talk about, right? So here's the sun, as we've talked about before, right? Most energy is emitted at the at the maximum wavelength, and it turns out that the color of the star is also determined by the maximum wavelength, the color that we see it as. This is why. Uh, we see actually this is, if we were to be a little more precise, we want to move this over a little bit, right, to the yellowish part. That's why the sun appears generally yellowish to us, okay? Another example, try this one. Okay, the minimum black body spectrum of light emitted from the sun is 480 nanometers. Calculating the temperature of the sun and its total power emitted, right? Pretty straightforward stuff, okay? Temperature of the sun, which we know to be about 6,000 Kelvin, okay, that's, this, is, this is where that comes from, okay, and then the total power emitted using the equations before, 4.5 times 10 to the 26 watts, which you've seen before, we came up with that in topic 8. And the last example for this video, the star Betelgeuse has a radius of 3.1 times 10 to the 11 meters and a surface temperature of 2,800 Kelvin. Find its luminosity. Hmm. Very simple application. L equals a sigma t to the fourth. 
You just rearrange the equation and you get 4.2 times 10 to the 30 watts.